Welcome to another episode of Inflection. I am Brian Berletic. Joining me as always is Angelo Giuliano. We took a little bit of a, a break. Angelo is traveling around in Venezuela, and now he has found a more stable internet connection. Angel okay, hi, and so, uh, hi, Angelo, how are you doing? Uh, very good, glad, glad to be back. We have a big piece today, big piece, Taiwan. Yeah. Taiwan and actually some very insider information. Yes, uh, because Taiwan is in the news. We're gonna go. We're gonna kind of go over a lot of the things that I've already been talking about in the last week or two about Taiwan. I want to get Angelo's take on it. Uh, we're gonna see if there's time for a question and answers at the very end. So if you have a question or answer uh, a question, wait until the end, and then we we will get to it. And then when you ask the question, just put like a big Q or the word question in all caps, and we'll try to get to it. Now. We're gonna talk about Taiwan. We're gonna talk about the provocations. We're gonna talk about the status of Taiwan because this is still something that when I talk to especially Westerners, even some people here in, in Thailand, people have no idea that Taiwan is not a country. It is not a country. Even Taiwan doesn't, doesn't pretend to be a country. You know, they don't have embassies overseas. Other countries don't have embassies in Taiwan. We're gonna go over all of that. And then we're going to talk about the idea of Taiwanese independence, how this is artificial, how it's being uh, imposed on the population by the US through political interference, through all of the same familiar uh, conduits, the National Endowment for Democracy, and then now there's this Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, which is kind of a franchise of the NED. So we're gonna go over all of that. Uh, so let's just jump right into it. And this is what everyone has been talking about. And look at this, look at this Voice of America headline. Why China sends warplanes into Taiwan's airspace, but doesn't attack. And of course, we know that these planes are not going into Taiwan's air. First of all, Taiwan doesn't have sovereign airspace. And th these planes were not even going into what would be considered Taiwan's sovereign airspace if they had any. And uh, this is actually where they went. So they're calling this the air defense identification zone. And these Chinese warplanes were flying here, n nowhere near Taiwan. And this is in international airspace. Uh, I've talked about this. Angela, do you have any uh, additional thoughts about all of this? Uh, I I I've already did done a, a video about this. Well, Brian, this is a non-event. You, you can see uh, those flights are very far from Taiwan. So it's, it's just part of the fear mongering. You know, it's about uh, this whole, you know, demonization of China. So it's it's a non-event. They just want to make, make it something big. Those are just exercises that are actually quite far from, from Taiwan. Yes. And I want to point out how non-news this actually is. Two Chinese military aircraft intrude into Taiwan's ADIZ, Air Defense Identification Zone. What's the date here? 2020. So this is something that they always, this is something that they always do. This is how Taiwan always reacts as if it was some sort of violation. And the Western media usually doesn't play it up. You usually don't even hear about this. But now because we're on this big anti-China push, they're taking this this story right here that is that is very ordinary happens all the time every single year now they're inflating it just like you said to to get this escalation going now there there's something else i wanted to talk to you and, and get your opinion on angelo this story well this was originally from the wall street journal secret group of us military trainers has been in taiwan for at least a year and uh b before i get your take on this i just want to point out that it was not a secret this was something again reported on in 2020 from Taiwan News. U.S. Marines officially training in Taiwan for first time since 1979. It's the first time since 1979 because back in the 70s, the U.S. agreed to withdraw all, all forces from Taiwan to no longer recognize the Republic of China government and to recognize the one China policy where Taiwan is part of China. There's only one legitimate government of China and that's in Beijing. So. Uh, Angela, when you saw this with with U.S. Marines on Taiwan, uh, what what do you think about this? Uh, 
I think it's probably very marginal. Keep in mind that uh, there's a large quantity of arms, U.S. arms, that's being sold to Taiwan. So you have probably a, a lot of consultants uh, in people from the U.S. Army on Taiwan soil. I, I think probably the, the size is probably small. I think I just want to mention one thing for Taiwanese. Uh, keep in mind that in 1979, actually, the U.S. dropped Taiwan. You know, I mean, Taiwan was being used before that, and they dropped Taiwan because they wanted to use China against the USSR. So you see, if Taiwanese uh, uh, think that the, the U.S. is actually acting for the good of Taiwan, they're completely mi being misled. You know, Taiwan is being used. Ch uh, Americans, the U.S. the U.S. government doesn't care about Taiwan. It just wants to use Taiwan as a pawn against China. It's very obvious. And you see, this is the example of uh, uh, the U.S. using a country and then dropping it. You've seen it over and over. You've, we've seen it in Vietnam. You've, we've seen it in Afghanistan. We've seen it in Ukraine. Ukraine is going to be the next one. Ukraine is being, going to be dropped. And what's the result? Economy completely destroyed. People divided. Uh, very good point. And uh, Beijing actually was warning these separatists, these independence-driven political parties in Taiwan. They were warning them, look at Afghanistan. If you think the U.S. is acting in your best interest, you're, you must be out of your mind. Look at what they did to Afghanistan. Uh, and it fits into a, a, a wider pattern of the U.S. doing this all, all around the globe. And uh, back, back uh, in November last year, this was announced, and then the Pentagon denied it, and then back to today, now they're revealing it and acting like it was a secret. So again, the timing, it's all about ratcheting up the, the pressure and escalating everything with China all at the same time. So the making a big deal out of these, these flights through the ADIZ, pretending like this was a secret and just revealing it now and putting this pressure on Beijing uh, to do something about it. You know, they're like, yeah, we're in Taiwan. We violated the one China policy. What are you going to, to do about it? And I want to point out to people the, the official stance. And I, I know I keep doing this in, in every video, but I think it's something really important to kind of set the, the foundation. So there's there's AUKUS and AUKUS says they were created because they need to put put pressure on China over the South China Sea, but also the Taiwan issue. They had the whole 60 Minutes Australia about how China is threatening Taiwan and everyone has to rush to their aid. So let's take a look at Australia. The official Australian government website, Australia-Taiwan relationship. And it says they re continued to recognize Taipei until the establishment of diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China in 1972. Australia's joint communique with the PRC recognized the government of the PRC as China's sole legal government and acknowledged the position of the PRC that Taiwan was a province of the PRC. So when you listen to Australian media today and they're like, China for some reason thinks that Taiwan is a province of China, it's because everyone recognizes it as a province of, of China, including Australia, the Australian government. That's their official stance. Uh, the UK, exactly the same story. Um, relations with the UK, the UK, like most other countries, does not recognize Taiwan nor maintain formal diplomatic relations with the island. Uh, and then, you know, they, they don't have an embassy on on Taiwan, neither does Australia. They have an office, an office in Taipei. What about the US government? This is really important because the US government above all other governments right now pretends like Taiwan is, is some kind of independent country that they're protecting from the mainland. And let's see, where, where does it say it? Uh, the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act provides the legal basis for the unofficial relationship between the United States and Taiwan. Why do they have an unofficial relationship? Because they do not recognize it as a country. It's part of China. And it's part of the, the one China policy. The United States does not support Taiwan independence. So that's their official stance. And we're going to go over evidence that, that that's just plain not true. Now, uh, one more. This is, this is let's, act, let's go to the top here. This is from 1972. So this is the Shanghai communique. This is what helped establish the one China policy that the U.S. and all other countries 
uh, recognize, and it says the United States uh, acknowledges that all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there is but one China and that Taiwan is a part of China. The United States government does not challenge that position. It reaffirms its interest in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. That means they will not interfere. And with this prospect in mind, it affirms the ultimate objective of the withdrawal of all US forces and military installations from Taiwan. And they did. And now they put troops back. And so we can see that it's the United States provoking China. It's not the other way around. It's not China provoking things. It's not China menacing Taiwan. It's the United States putting troops back there after they said they would withdraw and let China solve this on their own. And they're not doing that. And we're going to we're going to get into that. So um, it's really important. Uh, Angela, what is the American Institute in Taiwan? Can you explain to people what that is? Well, it's a type of uh, it's a type of embassy, you know, unofficial embassy. Uh, I I just want to add up one more thing to what you you just said before. Sure, it, it's really important that to say that it, even for Taiwan, um, it's uh, you know they it's important that uh, it's in the constitution uh, the one China policy. It, they, if they were to declare independence, Taiwan would have to amend the constitution and uh, and they would never get the, the uh, enough support in Taiwan to have people to amend the constitution. People wouldn't do that. So you see, whenever actually Tsai Ing-wen, the president of Taiwan, is going against China, she needs to be really careful because they, there's, a, there's a line not to cross that would be illegal to declare independence or just to go against the one China policy. So it's important. It is in the... Taiwanese constitution that there is only one China. It says in the constitution that Taiwan is not a country. Okay, and so the the American Institute in Taiwan, not a not an embassy, not a consulate. It's just this thing that they've made up. They they claim they recognize the one China policy, but all of this subversion is taking place through the American Institute in Taiwan. It's also taking place through the National Endowment for Democracy and also the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. This, when we're studying Taiwan and US subversion uh, inside Taiwan, we have to talk about the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy because this is kind of how the US is laundering its interference through in Taiwan. This is what they're doing. And you can see, that the NED and the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, if you look at this, if you, there, there's, who is that? That's um, Tsai Ing-wen. This is the, the current president of Taiwan. There she is side by side with Carl Gershman, the, the president of the National Endowment for Democracy. And if you listen to him talk about the National Endowment for Democracy, Taiwan, uh, Tsai Ing-wen and the, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, you will understand that it's all one thing. This is this is the U.S. hand reaching into China's internal political affairs in Taiwan specifically and artificially imposing this idea of independence. And this is something the U.S. vowed not to do. This is what they agreed to with Beijing. And it's no surprise that the U.S. has, has broken their word but what it does do is demonstrate who is provoking the situation here, who is driving this escalating conflict. It is the US, it is not Beijing. And so all of these description below, it's there's a lot of stuff. We, we're gonna have to do like another episode on all on very specific things here, right, Angelo? Uh, we're gonna go through all of this and then we're gonna see how much time we have left, but we're, we're gonna have certain topics that we have to go into in real depth. So the notion of independence, um, is this a good idea? Is this something that the people in Taiwan have arrived at on their own? And does it reflect their own best interests? This is this is what we're going to talk about today. Angelo, uh, just a quick overview. How, what do you think about that? Do you think that pursuing independence would be in the best interests of the people of Taiwan, why or why not? Well, if you look, I think it's important to look at facts. You know, 10% uh, of a Taiwan, Taiwanese population lives in the mainland. So you have, you have uh, deep interconnections of economies. Uh, de facto, uh, Taiwan economy is reunited with, the, with China. There's over 40% of trade 
of uh, of uh, Taiwanese trade that is done with with China. Uh, if you look at the, the polls, you know they do polls about uh, uh, identity. Uh, it, those those have changed. You know when I was living in Taiwan 25 years ago, uh, Taiwanese were identifying themselves as Chinese. As Chinese. Now it has changed a bit. It's more like localization. It's the same as if you ask an American, he would say, well, uh, before he's, he's saying, where are you from? They would say, well, I'm from New York, but then New York is part of, uh, of the US. Well, it's the same as Taiwan. Taiwanese, if you ask them, they, they will say, I'm from Taiwan. There's a pride of being locally from Taiwan, but deeply inside, they are Chinese. So the, when whenever they ask, they, they do those polls, they're trying to, to put a bias in the question. But in reality, what Taiwanese want is the status quo. Status quo is really important to understand because they, they have a good life. They have a good relationship with China. Why change? It's the same from both sides. Both sides are looking for status quo. Some are more pro-independence, but even the pro-independence want a status quo because they know that breaching the one China policy would mean war. Why go to war? Life is good. I mean, you know, the, uh, China is not an enemy. Look at facts, you know. The, the only problem is that Taiwan, as, as we, we look a bit later, is Taiwan is be, Taiwan's democracy has been hijacked, you know, and, and how do you, you hijack a democracy? It's when you control the information space, you know, when it's, it's controlled by the U.S., when you have actually funding, you know, you have uh, the meddling of the U.S. And, and, and uh, Tsing Wen is a good example. She is a U.S. pawn. Uh, when you, the U.S. is controlling the president of Taiwan, then can we call it a, still a democracy? No, it's not. It's not. They want to build up another democracy, which is a fake one, the same, you know, in, which is corrupted, like like the same as in the U.S. So, so um, I think we will it will be interesting just to to show a little bit about uh, Tsai Wen. What is behind this person? You know how, you know how come she was already talking to AIT, AIT, which is uh, kind of the the, the U.S. Embassy in Taiwan, unofficial U.S. Embassy in Taiwan. Uh, just a timeline. In 2005, she was not even the president of the DPP, the party of DPP, which is pro-independence. She was already meeting with the AIT. And she was giving uh, insider information about what, what was going on in the DPP. So you see, you have this meddling. You have a party of the opposition, someone who is not even an official from that party, which is meeting with the with the embassy in 2005. Then in 2008, she became the, the president of the DPP. And then later on in 2016, she became the president of Taiwan. So you see, they've been grooming her and they, they've been, and she's been giving uh, the, the embassy and the, the US intelligence information about the politics in Taiwan. Uh, additional to that, you know, she she claims to have a PhD. You know, it's a uh, she in reality she doesn't have a PhD. The the issue the the her thesis was uh, published only in 2019, and it's been co-written with someone else. You know, so for 20 years they've been pushing you know for her to release that thesis, and now by surprise there's a thesis that comes out, and it was actually co-written and. They didn't want. They don't even want to give more information on who was, you know, a teacher, you know, for doing the PhD thesis. So, so Sai Ing Wen, and and if you this, these are just three uh, WikiLeak leaked cables from the U.S. Uh, there are so many. I couldn't fit all of the links into the video description, so I I just picked three that I thought helped illustrate this point. So Angela was talking about one from. 2005. So she's reporting to the United States government regularly on a regular basis. Imagine Nancy Pelosi sneaking into the Chinese embassy and reporting to the Chinese embassy, the ambassador, all of the inner workings of the, the, the DNC and what she's doing in Congress and what, what's going on and what her plans are for the future. Could you imagine that? That would be blatant treason, wouldn't it? And that this is what she was doing for years and years and years before she came to, to power. And now this one I want to point out because I think this ties into what you were just saying about the economy. And and just uh, real quick, let's look at this again. The, Taiwan's export market is is the mainland and Hong Kong 
overwhelmingly, if they declared independence and, and China decided we're going to isolate you economically, their economy would collapse. But check out this this cable and what what she's saying to the American Institute in Taiwan, this fake de facto embassy. The Chinese are coming, Tsai warned, calling the growing danger the cost of deepening ties with the PRC. With the Taiwan economy in difficult straits, she added, people do not have a choice and will work with anyone who can pay them. And they're, they're just saying the basic reality is that Taiwan, by proximity, is dependent on the mainland for their economy. They're right off the coast of mainland China. Their economy is more or less in, uh, being integrated. And they depend on the export market. They depend on imports. So it, it's just common sense that their fate is entwined with the mainland. Being independent makes no sense at all. It is an artificial dream, completely detached from all reality, economic reality, geopolitical reality. It's completely, it completely makes no sense at all. Uh, so I thought that was important to point out. Now, Angela, you were just telling me before the show, before, before she came to power, uh, I think you said around 20, 2014, 2015, the relationship between Taiwan and the mainland was the best it had ever been. Can you can you explain that a little bit? Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, in 2014, there was an agreement to be signed, a trade agreement to be signed between Taiwan and uh, and China. Back then, uh, the Kuomintang and uh, Ma Ying-jeou was was the president of Taiwan. You need to, uh, and then in 2014, what they did, they they, they instigated a, a movement, you know, kind of a very similar pattern that uh, you can find in color revolution. That's a sunflower movement. And actually they kind of su succeeded because they put a lot of pressure and actually they occupied the, the Congress. The Congress in Taiwan is called the Legis Legislative Yuan. And you, you can imagine not only they rushed into the, con the, the legis legislative UN, but they occupied it for a few weeks, so which is completely illegal. And none of those protesters were charged, you know, because of the DPP put a lot of pressure not to go after those protesters. So this had a big impact uh, on, on the politics in Taiwan. Additional to that, during the same time in Hong Kong, you had the, the umbrella movement. The relationship, there's plenty of relationship between them. And I think this is the root of the multi-alliance. You know, it started with Taiwan movement and Hong Kong movement, and they were actually already working together. So because of those movements, the, the DPP actually gained support. So in 2015, Kuomintang was still in charge, still in power. Mind Zhou actually met with Xi Jinping. And uh, since 1949, the, that time in 2015, we are talking about only six years ago, Taiwan has never been so as close to reunification because with this trade agreement, it would it would really make the Taiwan de facto reunited with China. So what happens that you know that there was a lot of pressure from outside, and then uh, and that the DPP actually they managed to change this balance. But you see, I mean, only six years ago, mind you. President of Taiwan was meeting with Xi Jinping. You know, things were well, you know, until until the meddling from outside. So this is the problem, you know, if if only there was no foreign interference, you know, China, China would just be at peace with, with Taiwan. And, and 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 you know, it would just be a matter of time where Taiwan could be reunited. I just want to add up one thing. Uh, the DPP did everything it could to destroy the one country to system in Hong Kong. So they were actually financing, they were giving support, they were even given, you know, uh, uh, heaven for the writers, uh, uh, the, the writers in Hong Kong who actually go to Taiwan to seek uh, to, to, to seek uh, protection. So you see, uh, so why? Because the because the in, in Hong Kong there's a one country two system, and China wanted to apply the same system in Taiwan. They wanted to show Taiwan. You see, in Hong Kong, there's a possibility of reunited with Taiwan this, with the same model as you have in Hong Kong. You can keep your autonomy. You know, it's just for China. It's just a matter of of pride. Uh, Taiwan is the last piece missing for for ending up this uh, century of humiliation. Keep in mind that 
that the China has been humiliated. The Opium War and the occupation, long time occupation, uh, you know, and, and Taiwan was, is the last piece. It was occupied by, by Japan until, uh, until the World War II. And, and it's still the piece that needs to go back to the motherland. And this is, this is the, for, for China, it's a matter of, 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 uh, of sovereignty and, and pride. Yeah, and, and I, I just want to impress again on, upon people that if you look at those WikiLeak cables, so that was before the Sunflower Movement, before that meeting uh, with, with, the, with the Chinese president, uh, the, the economy in Taiwan suffers because they have these irrational pro, pro-independent proclivities, if you will, and it irrationally tries to block out Chinese, Chinese uh, mainland investment, basically. Uh, but a- again, you you just looked at the trade. Despite that, it's still their their biggest market. It still is, and the, and the integration is still happening. So they did. They deliberately derailed it, and it is a product of foreign interference. Because a, a question a lot of people ask me is, if if the people in Taiwan want independence, why can't they fight for that? Why can't they aspire towards that? It's because they don't really they don't really want that. They just think they do, because this idea has been put into their head, and not by Taiwan's own politicians, but by the US. This has been their plan all along. This is something they've been working on all along. And I wanna kind of show you uh, a piece together, a little bit of a timeline of the Sunflower Movement. So they have this leader, his name is Lin Fei Fan, and he was the leader of the Sunflower Movement in 2014, but this is dated 2013. So this is a year before that. Where is Lin Fei Fan, a year before the Sunflower Movement starts, he's in the United States. He's at uh, George Washington University. And here he is, even though China is a socialist country, it does not hesitate to use capitalism to exert its influence. Graduate Student Association of National Taiwan University President Lin Fei Fan said, one of the organizers of the Youth Alliance Against Media Monsters, who else was there? Uh, let's come down here. Uh, Louis Chang, Senior East Asia Officer at the National Endowment for Democracy. This, so this was an NED event, and this is where this Sunflower Movement leader was a year before the movement started. Just like Joshua Wong and all of them, they were all interconnected with the NED and, and U.S. government-backed uh, organizations before, during, and after. So was Lin Fei Fan. And so this is a diplomat article about the actual sunflower movement. Uh, of course, it's from a Western perspective, but here is 2014, just to give you a timeline. Uh, and then here he is. And it was funny because Lin Fei Fan said during the protest that they had no connection to the Democratic Progressive Party, this pro independence political party in Taiwan backed by the US. He, they said, we have no connection to it. And then all of the members of the Sunflower Movement got absorbed into the DPP because the DPP was behind it the whole time. And the way this all works is that, uh, where is it? Here, the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy gets their, they don't get their money from the NED. Not, not that I know of, they get it from taxpayers in Taiwan, but it serves the exact same purpose as the NED and it's completely intertwined with the NED. So you have NED staffers and people representing US special interests working inside the Taiwan uh, Foundation for Democracy. And I I actually, I opened this up because I want you to look National Endowment for Democracy. I want you to see how many search results come back when you type that in. It's over a thousand. It's over a thousand results because that's all the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy does is work together with the National Endowment for Democracy. So they take money from taxpayers and then they feed it back into these political parties like the Democratic Progressive Party, the DPP, the pro-independence party. And then they are the ones who are using that money to put people out on the streets during the, the Sunflower Movement. And, and that was how it was working. Uh, and then after, let's see, uh, when... uh, Brian, can I just add up one thing? Uh, this foundation, you know, the, the replica of National Endowment for Democracy for Taiwan, actually funded in 2007, uh, gave a grant of one million US dollar to the memorial of victim of communists, 
And the same, the same entity, the same NGOs is actually uh, that one that is funding Adrian Zenz. Who is Adrian Zenz? Is the person that actually all the fake news are coming from when it comes to Xinjiang. This whole thing about one million Uyghur being uh, supposedly in concentration camps, uh, this whole news comes from Adrian Zenz, which is paid by the Memorial of Victim of Communists, which is actually funded by this uh, Taiwan NED version. Yes, and, and the US government itself. So you could see how they, they work in tandem on absolutely everything anti-China. And uh, so I talked about Lin uh, Fei Fan before the Sunflower Movement in the United States, working with the NED during being supported by the DPP, getting money from the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. And then this is 2018. So this is after the Sunflower Movement was over. Uh, and there they are. And, and they're at this Students for Free Tibet. Students for Free Tibet is an independence. It's a, it's a separatist. It's a separatist organization, just like the US funds the Uyghur separatist groups. The US is also supporting Tibetan separatist groups. And it's right here, Students for a Free Tibet. Where is it? It's down here somewhere. Oh, they, got a, they got a lot. Maybe I got it. Oh, right here. Students for a Free Tibet. So funded by the NED. So that is, that is the leader of the Sunflower Movement at an NED funded event afterwards, before, and then, and then getting money from the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy during. And so this idea of independence did not come from the Taiwanese people themselves. They did not arrive at this themselves thinking about what is in their best interest. This is being imposed on them. It's being put into their head through the media, just like the, the media in the West puts the idea of, of war into people's heads. These are not ideas that serve the best interests of the people. For Taiwan, independence would destroy their economy. Their economy would be destroyed by that. It, it would not work out well for them. Uh, so... Let's go, because you were yeah. talking about the media, Angela, and I think, yeah, yeah. Uh, go, ahead. go ahead. I'd like to talk a bit about the media, you know, the, the, the information space. Well, first of all, keep in mind that the social media in Taiwan are all control, you know, all U.S. social media. So you know how Facebook, you know, Twitter and so on, how they actually control that space. Additional to that, there are very large media, anti-Chinese media, in Taiwan, and some are actually be very linked to the even the CIA. I mean, uh, Apple Daily, which is one of the most popular uh, media in Taiwan, is actually managed by Mark, Mark Simons, who's an ex agent from the CIA. And uh, uh, another one, Epoch Time. Epoch Time is one of the 10 biggest uh, media in Taiwan. Epoch Time is directly financed by by the u.s government it's finance uh, it, it's part of the financing through the u.s agm uh, so you see the information space is completely controlled by the u.s and the few media chinese pro-chinese media uh, that were existing in taiwan has been expelled so now you have the same case scenario as you have in, in Ukraine. You have only one version, only one media. So it's just the ground for, for just manipulating the, the minds of people. Exactly. If you do not have a balanced media environment and you have the U.S. dumping money in, even though they promised that they would let the Chinese people sort this out themselves and Chinese people, including the people living in Taiwan, they agreed to let them sort it out. But you can see that that's not what's happening. So this is this is exactly like you just said, Angelo, in, in Ukraine, they're getting rid of all the Russian language media. Anyone who's pro-Russian or anyone who, who was interested in a more balanced society, a more sane society, they have been silenced and all that's left are the extremists. And this is exactly the process that's taking place in Taiwan. So this is from 2020, France 24, not not uh, CGTN, not Global Times. This is Western media. And they're admitting that they're expelling uh, Chinese journalists because they're talking about reunification. But what about separatism? You have tai Taiwan's Apple Daily. They're, they're given free reign to do whatever they want in Taiwan and uh, just... So people remember, this is the guy who was running Apple Daily, Jimmy Lai. He was literally in the White House. And in case you're wondering what his connection was to the U.S. government, he openly conspired with the U.S. government in, in the White House. Uh, so pr pretty much case closed there. 
I, I think we've actually managed to cover everything that I wanted to cover regarding Taiwan. This is kind of an overview of what, what the prov provocations are right now, Sunflower Movement, an introduction to the Sunflower Movement, how the leaders were literally at NED funded events the year before. And then after, that's all they've been doing. And they were absorbed into the DPP, this pro-independence uh, party in Taiwan and how this idea of independence is artificial and it's being imposed on the people in Taiwan. And it's contra to their best interests. It will destroy their economy. It will create conflict uh, between the mainland and Taiwan, but also between China and the United States. So this is a complete disaster the US is steering the world towards. And if you read the news, all you're going to see is China is provoking the, the situation. Angela, do you have any other uh, ideas or thoughts you would like to uh, share before we move to questions and answers? Uh, I just want to go back to a little bit of history. Uh, Taiwan is a very young democracy. Uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, for 38 years, it was one of the longest martial law in, in uh, world history. So uh, Taiwan slowly became a democracy in 1989. Uh, before before that, it was completely under control of the Kuomintang. Uh, so what happened right after, you started to have those NGOs, US NGOs, and uh, the subsidiaries of uh, NED, National Endowment for Democracy, for who those, uh, just for our viewers, uh, I mean, National Endowment for Democracy, it's a, it's a different version, you know, it's the same version of uh, the CIA, with the difference that they are doing this now openly. So now you have at the same time those NGOs opening up in Taiwan with the function of creating, I mean, subverting, I mean, changing the minds of people, propaganda, uh, and, and, and actually helping in creating parties. So when you look at that, right then, at the same time, you have the DPP that, that is being created at the same year. So we can see clearly there's a link, you know, the DPP is a creation of the U.S. It's controlled by the U.S. You have a person that has been working with the U.S. Embassy even before becoming the president of the DPP. And so they've been grooming her. It's the same as Aung San Suu Kyi in Burma, in Myanmar. She was groomed and they slowly put her in power. They, they do a lot of propaganda. They, they push her through Western media to be the, the new woman who's going to change Taiwan. That's what they did. The same as they did with Aung San Suu Kyi in Myanmar, the same as they did with, with uh, Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan. It's another US puppet. And she's not working for Taiwan. She's working for the US and not for the interest of, of Taiwanese people. And, and I, I, I wanted to bring this up real quick. So this was from 2009, and this is the US interfering directly in Taiwan's internal political affairs. So uh, if, you, if you recognize Taiwan as part of China, uh, even different parts of China have their own internal political affairs, and this is the US openly interfering. So this is US group pressures Ma on the uh, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy shuffle. In a letter to Ma Ying Jua, the National Endowment for Democracy said it had concerns over the independence of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy. Uh, independence, there's no independence. It's, it's run by the US, it's run by the NED. And they're worried that this was being closed off. Because as you were saying, Angelo, uh, under President Ma, things were getting better between Taiwan and the mainland. And, and unification was going to happen. It was going to be slow, incremental, it, it would be the status quo and it would be done so slowly, hardly anyone would even notice it. And it would be smooth and it would work in the best interests of everyone on both sides of the strait. And the U.S. did not want that. And they did not want their their ability to pull on the levers of, of Taiwan's political landscape. Uh, they did not want that ability taken away from them. So this was Carl Gershman writing to the president of Taiwan saying, don't touch the, T the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, leave it the way it is, leave it where we have influence over it and we could manipulate your political landscape. That's what this whole article is about. Uh, and it's ridiculous. And when people talk about Taiwanese independence and the people deciding for themselves, you cannot have self-determination if there is political interference from, from abroad involved. You cannot. That is the whole reason 
uh, foreign interference is recognized universally as a bad thing. Uh, so this this is what was going on in in Taiwan and is what is going on in Taiwan right now. And this is at the crux of the problem. So unless you have anything else, Angelo, we could get into uh, questions and answers. I got the last one. I got the last one, Brian. Sure, is sure, that, sure. There was an interview of a, a military, a retired military in, in Taiwan. And actually what he said, he said, if we were to fight against China, I... Uh, Taiwanese army should lay, should not fight. We should actually take over, take over the country and uh, and topple the DPP. I mean, U.S. backed, U.S. controlled DPP party. That gives you, an, uh, you mean, some information. If you look at scenarios, uh, I think I think this could be a scenarios. Again, you know, when you when you really listen to uh, Xi Jinping talks, he always say. Zhongguoren, meaning Chinese don't fight Chinese. Why? Why would you fight your own brothers? You know. So, so they 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 never talk about being aggressive against Taiwan. It's all about peaceful reunification. It's just the interpretation. You know, it's just a Western interpretation. You know. So why why you know like, like having the West? I mean the U.S., which is miles and miles away, just to meddle it into internal affair. You know, this is family. Family affairs between Chinese. Let Chinese deal with their own history and, and problems. Okay, so we're we're gonna open the, the floor to questions. If you have a question, put a big Q or write the word question in all caps and we'll see what we can do to help answer it. Uh, and you're absolutely right, Angela. While we're waiting for some questions. Uh, the the idea of t Taiwan, uh, the, the their military fighting with the mainland is ridiculous. They they wouldn't stand a chance. It wouldn't benefit them at all. And by the way, um, Tsai Ing Wen, I mean she is she is violating the one China policy. She is working contra to Taiwan's own constitution, and she's working against the best interests of everybody in. Uh, is someone saying that the video is frozen? If, it, if there's any kind of technical problems, please put it in the, just type it in and we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. She's working against the best interests of the people of Taiwan. And so the military in Taiwan, I would assume like any military anywhere is bound to uphold the, the law of the land and the best interests of the people. And if, uh, the current president of Taiwan is bringing Taiwan down this dangerous path, and it, it would if things got out of hand, if things were getting too extreme for the military to just say enough is enough. Uh, a, a coup is like the last resort, and it's not is not ideal by any stretch of the imagination, but it's better than war, I would say. It's better than war. It's better than declaring independence and destroying the economy and, and creating a global crisis. Uh, and you know, and then after that, some serious work would have to be done uprooting the DPP and all the foreign influences that built it up, uh, just like they had to do in Hong Kong, and then see what happens when the dust settles. Uh, I think a lot of people are waiting to see what happens in Hong Kong now that all of this foreign interference was uprooted. Is, is there still going to be uh, character and independence in Hong Kong to a certain extent within, within the agreement with Beijing? And then if so, then maybe Taiwan won't be so apprehensive about the future. But I think they're trying to rush things before that happens. Okay, so let's see. Uh, questions are, is there any leaders that could stand up against this Taiwanese president? So Angelo, you're more familiar with the landscape in Taiwan, the political landscape in Taiwan than I am. Uh, is there anyone from from the, the old party, KM, KMT, that could compete against the DPP? Uh, not really. I, I think people are, um, it, it, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan's democracy, it's, uh, there's a very high, uh, high level of dissatisfactions. You know, it's the same, it's the same uh, pattern we have in the, in the US, it's elected regrets. So people, there, there's probably only, even though 
you know, the elected sign when, but she, she's, she's got maybe 30 or, or maximum 40% of support. You know, there's not much support and there's not much alternative. Keep in mind that you control, uh, when you have the US controlling the information space, it, it's becoming more and more difficult for the Kuomintang to get back into power. So the last one that was actually quite popular was Meng Zhou. And keep also in mind that uh, both parties are, are very corrupted. There are lots of cases of corruption. Uh, the last example is uh, Chen Shui-bian. He was, uh, was put in prison for 11 years in 2010 because of corruption. The funny thing is that uh, DPP came into power because they said they wanted to fight corruption. And guess what? Their president went into jail for corruption case. Another thing is now he's been out for a long time, you know, he's not in jail now uh, because DPP put a lot of pressure for him to get out of prison. So I'm asking, where is the rule of law? This is not, I mean, rule of law. They are actually praising Western democracies, uh, Western liberal democracies to be to to respect the rule of law but there's no rule of law you know and, and unfortunately when the united states sinks its hooks into a country like myanmar for example uh the, the the national league for democracy could stand in any election and win by a landslide and it didn't matter what anyone else did because the u.s was just pumping so much money in on their side uh, that no one could compete against them. This is the this is one of many Achilles' heels of the of Western style democracy. Is how easy it is to rig it if you can control the system, if you can pump money into campaigns, if you control the media, then you could get literally anybody into office, no matter how incompetent or how obvious they are working against the best interests of the people in that country. Now, someone asked a question: What is the difference between the PRC? and the ROC, so the People's Republic of China and the Republic of China. Well, everyone in the world recognizes the People's Republic of China, whose uh, capital is in Beijing, and hardly anyone recognizes the Republic of China, whose capital is Taipei. Uh, even the US, Australia, UK, AUKUS, they all officially recognize Beijing as the government, the legitimate government of the entire, the entirety of China, which includes Taiwan. So they don't recognize the Republic of China. They, they very unambiguously said, we are breaking off all relations with the ROC. And I, I, I meant to show people this. Hold on a second. Even Taiwan doesn't pretend that it's a country. Look, this is what they have in the United States. They don't have an embassy, a Taiwan embassy in the U.S. They have Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the United States. It almost sounds like a, a tourist, a tourist company that that does package tours or something. It's not an embassy. It's not a consulate. They're not a real country. They themselves recognize that no matter how uh, how much they don't want to, but they have to, because that is the reality. Uh, let's look for some more questions here. Angela, have you any popped out that you No, saw? I haven't seen it, but uh, in terms of recognition of Taiwan, there's a there's only a few islands. We are talking about, you know, Micronesia, I don't know, I mean, Palau Island, I mean, extremely small islands. So it's it's just marginal, you know, it's just because Taiwan is, is being actually buying, buying, uh, you know, investing uh, massively into, into those islands. Yes. And uh, yeah, that, that is something the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy does. They, they kind of do the same thing the NED does to, uh, to, to actually help the NED spread Western influence around the region. And someone asked about this whole situation with AUKUS and Taiwan. And then, of course, we have the U.S.-backed protests here in Thailand. We see the, the terrorists in Myanmar backed by the U.S. Uh, yes, this is part of a, a kind of like an Asia spring. Uh, and they're trying to reorganize the entire region. They're trying to encircle and contain China. And they're doing that by removing all the governments uh, in power right now who want to do business with China. They don't want to join a US-led crusade against China. And so the US has to fund opposition groups to put pressure on them or overthrow them and replace them with client regimes that, that will work against China and also against the best interests of literally everybody in this region. Nobody benefits from this. Not even Australia is benefiting from this. Uh, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, Let me see, because there's questions coming in and then it's scrolling up. 
Angela, if you see anything that you want to take, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add, add up one thing. I mean, we, we always talk about democracy. Uh, I think it's not because you have uh, one person, one vote that actually it makes it a democracy. You know, the a lot of people think that the rigging are being done at the ballots, you know, when you count, you do the counting. It's not that. It's about the conditions, it, the condition where you're running elections. If the information space is run by Western powers, that doesn't make Taiwan democracy. When there's massive funding, not only in the information space, but also in the parties, that doesn't make it a democracy because a democracy, again, is a process of self-determination, you know. Do Taiwanese really control their future? No. When you have the media that are funded by Western powers that are actually going uh, against your own interest, I mean, what choices people have? You know, they, they think they have choices, but they don't. They don't. You know, it's it's all now. It's a it's a battle of, of information, and we see we see like all voices that are pro peace for multiple world. You know, we we you know they do everything to silent us. So that, that gives you a, a good idea on, 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 you know, the hypocrisy about this, all those terms, you know, related to democracy. Okay, I think we're gonna take two more questions. One was on the situation in the South China Sea, which, which connects to this, and also one about the Milk Tea Alliance. So the South China Sea, this is a series of overlapping maritime disputes. These are normal. Every country that has access to the sea has maritime disputes with other countries. These are things that can kind of flare up and get kind of intense, but they never come even remotely close to unraveling into some sort of conflict. They're always brought back from the brink bilaterally and that's what's been going on in the South China Sea forever. And so we're all familiar with the nine dash line that China claims, but did you know that Taiwan has 11 dashes? Did you know that? Angela, did you know that? Yeah, I, I do know that. You know, so, so are you familiar? Yeah. Are, are, you, are you familiar with the story of why Taiwan has 11 dashes and why China, oh, China, the mainland only has nine? Do you know? Oh, I used to know, I forgot, I forgot, but it's related okay. to a long time. I, I, long I, time just, I just learned this from talking with Carl Za. People who don't know Carl Za, I, I'm going to type it in. Search him up on uh, YouTube. He's, he's a great, he has a, he's an encyclopedia about uh, Chinese history. He's a great so, so, so what happened was Taiwan and, and, and mainland China have the exact same encompassing claim over the South China Sea, but uh, China worked out with Vietnam, they, they resolved a dispute. And so China reduced from 11 to nine and, and, and gave a certain claim to Vietnam because this is bilateral resolution. They didn't need the US involved. So they went from 11 to nine dashes, but Taiwan still claims all 11 dashes. They still claim all 11 dashes. And what was funny was the US arranged this tribunal at, at The Hague at some arbitration court. It's not a real court has no no legally binding power or enforcement mechanism. And surprise, they ruled in favor of the Philippines against uh, China. And of course, Beijing rejected it. It was it was a circus, it had, had no relevance and they did not recognize it. But guess who else rejected it? Taiwan. And they even sent patrol ships to the disputed water to, to demonstrate how little they thought of this tribunal. The US, the, the underwriter of Taiwan's current political order. Uh, is it, so the, the whole thing, the whole thing is crazy. In the South China Sea, this can be resolved. The, the countries in the region do not see China bullying any, any more or less than anywhere else where these maritime disputes take place. And by the way, all of the countries in Southeast Asia have conflicting claims with each other as well. And they'll impound each other's boats. Uh, I think Indonesia and Malaysia were like, they would seize the boats. There were nobody on it or anything. And then they would like uh, very publicly blow them up in the middle of the ocean to, to warn, hey, don't come into our waters. And so this is a thing that's been going on forever. And the US is inserting itself into this uh, these disputes and trying to escalate it into a crisis. So it's always the US provoking and escalating absolutely everything. Um, Angela, you got anything to add to the South China Sea before I move on to Milk Tea Alliance? No, well, uh, we talked about this. I mean, uh, the, the biggest risk for China, uh, I think it's more about blockade. 
You know, uh, there's an encirclement of China and there's a possible blockade. Uh, we're talking about mainly the Malacca Strait, and that's the biggest risk. So in reality, uh, the U.S. wants to, to push for freedom of navigation, but in reality, freedom of navigation in the South China Sea, it, it, it is important for South China Sea countries, but not so much for the U.S. I mean, you know, this is a national, you know, it's a... National security for those countries is extremely important just to, to have this freedom of navigation more than for the US. So so why why would they go against their own own interest? You know, what those countries want is it's again status quo, you know. There are problems. You know what they say, Chinese they say, look for what unites us and, and you know put aside the differences. It's the same, you know, it's the same about keeping up the status quo. Going to war, you know, it's a lose-lose. Now you just keeping the status quo, you know, things over time we will get better, you know, we'll they'll solve the pro those problems, you know. But there's there is no problem. Those problems are, are just just problems that are that the US is creating. It is actually divide and conquer. They they're putting those countries against each other. And you see the results, you know, facts, no Asian countries is going to join the AUKUS so far. You know, I just yeah. want to add one, one more thing. Is sure. it the Philippines could be at risk, you know. Now you have uh, the next elections, you know, the the daughter of uh, Duterte against Pacquiao, and and I have my doubts about Pacquiao. You know, he's extremely, I mean, very U.S., uh, pro-U.S. and anti-China. That that's a risk, you know. I, I mean, it, the risk is one of Asian countries would join AUKUS, but so far no, nobody's joining, you know. And and even Australia is not much so much in the region. You know, why, you know, I mean, there's no point. It doesn't make any sense, you know. This is this is what I always try to point out to people. Uh, you'll hear people say, hey, you know, look, what if, if China is so great, why are all these countries upset about what China is doing? Why are they joining with the U.S. and doing naval exercises? The, the, the countries in Southeast Asia join with the U.S. and do naval exercises. That's true. But then they also join China and do naval exercises because they're not interested in joining this being on one side or the other. They Their export markets are distributed between China and the West. They don't want to give up any of it. They just want to live and let live. They're not interested in being part of this. So that's why you have AUKUS, where it's it's almost like literally the, the absolute extreme uh, realms from from China, like the U.S. all the way on the other side of the Pacific, the U.K. all the way there in the Atlantic, and and Australia all the way in the South. Like you couldn't get further from China if you you tried. And this is these are the countries that are concerned about China. I don't think so. And and why is it that no one in the actual region is interested in this? It's because the U.S. is lying like they always lie. And what is the Milk Tea Alliance? That dovetails perfectly into what is the Milk Tea Alliance. The Milk Tea Alliance are all of these anti-China opposition groups the U.S. has built up across Southeast Asia. And why? Because none of the governments in the region are interested in working with the U.S. on this anti-China project. The Milk Tea Alliance is a political movement meant to pressure the governments to do so. And if, if failing that, they want to replace them with a client regime in each one of these countries that will be anti-China and join the US in this anti-China crusade. So say in Thailand, for example, we have this guy, Tanatan, Juang Grung, Grung Ket. He is this billionaire. Before the 2019 Thai general elections, he went off to the US to meet with the State Department, USAID, Freedom House, which is a subsidiary of the National Endowment for Democracy. When he came back, he was telling Thai people, we should cancel the Thai-China high-speed rail and replace it with Hyperloop. And Hyperloop is, is like a theoretical mass transit system that doesn't even exist yet. So he just wanted to cancel projects with China. That was it. That's his plan. And if he worms his way to power, he will turn Thailand into the same as Australia, uh, cutting its nose off to spite its face just for the US and ruining everything. Ch China and Thailand right now have very close ties, very beneficial ties. And they would be throwing all of that away if these milk tea alliance opposition groups and the political parties they're linked to get into power. So uh, very dangerous times between that and what's going on with Taiwan. We're in very dangerous times. So that's why we're focusing on this so much. Um, Angela, do you have uh, anything else you want to add? No, it's, it's just, uh, again, I think it's important just to to, keep, to have people to, to be kept in, informed. Uh, now, now we tend to see in the Western news and even you mentioned even a uh, 
you know, those progressive media actually turning to also against China. It's important just to to really dig, just get stay informed, you know, because because there's a huge propaganda. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a it's an interesting time to live. And and uh, again, I think every day that passes, that that's the way I think it. The way every day that passes is one day that we don't have war, that we are getting, getting further away from war because. Time is in favor of a multipolar world. If we manage, if China manage, China and Russia manage not to be at war in the next 10 years, then we should be safe and we should finally go into a new world order, which actually would be multipolar. You know, and it's interesting, you mentioned just before AUKUS. I mean, this AUKUS thing, think about it. They are white guys, all English speakings, and trying to save Asian people. Think about it, you know. Absurd. Never stopped. Imperialist is still there. It's still there. It's just more subtle. It wants to teach. You know, it used to, to, to want to export civilization. Teach those brown guys, yellow guys. Oh, you know what? We are, you don't live the way you should be living. That's the same now. They're coming here and they're saying, well, you need human rights. We are going to teach you. We are going to teach about democracy, even though it doesn't work in the U.S., but, you know, it might work in, in your place, you know. Uh, you, you know, we, we, have to, we want to, you to be inclusive. You want to be et cetera, et cetera. Well, why would you want to export something that is not working at home? And why do you want to teach? You are, U.S. is how many years? 200, 300 years of history. I mean, we are going, we are talking about civilizations that have three, four, five thousand 5,000 years in Asia. And they are getting tired, you know, the global south is getting tired of this, this imperialist agenda. It's about keeping the, the global south poor. It's all about this. It's control them, keep them poor. It's more subtle now. In the Africa, they're controlling the currency. 14 countries in Africa have a French, French currency a CFA being issued. And 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 uh, and the rest, they have their democracy being controlled. It's more subtle, but it's still the same. It's about controlling you and keeping you poor because the West is being still rich and and keep on being rich because the they control the poor South. And with China, this could change. Things could change because China is actually developing the global South through the Belt and Road Initiative, and it is it is finally going to be a win-win option. That's very well said, Angelo. I, I don't think I could have said it better myself. Uh, all really important points. Uh, I, and I was just looking this week at an example, Lao, which is Thailand's neighbor to the north, Lao, this, this Southeast Asian landlocked country. I remember traveling there many, many times. And I remember when the capital of Lao, Vientiane, was this dusty town. There were there, It's the capital of the country and they had unpaved roads in many parts. And I remember these Western NGO uh, organizations with their SUVs, you know, bouncing down the road and putting up banners telling people in loud, don't use electricity because they were doing exactly what you said, Angelo. They're keeping them poor, keeping them subordinate. Did you know that the G7 countries combined, their population doesn't even match China, China alone. And so how do you represent a minority and keep control over the majority by keeping everyone else down. And that's what they've been doing. And what is happening in Laos now? They're going to, they, they just today, today is Friday, China delivered the first high-speed rail passenger train to Laos, to their capital, Vientiane, and it will go into operation this year in December. Tell me what the U.S. has ever built in Laos. And the answer is absolutely nothing, nothing. And, and they never were going to. And so this is our choice, uh, development and progress and multipolarism or perpetual hegemony by, by the West, by a minority, a tiny minority determined to keep everybody else down. That is our choice. That's what we're choosing here. And this, this is why we do this show every week and why Angelo and I uh, work very hard to get this message out. So uh, Angelo, thank you so much for joining me again. I hope we, we can thank start you. doing this weekly again. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to cover, and I, I really value your insight, and, and I learn something new every time we do this. So thank you. Thank you, everybody who, who joined us live today. Thank you very much. Look in the video description for all the links that we went over. 
And uh, until next week, uh, bye for now.